All right, in Romans, the third chapter, the 26th verse. To, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Okay, tonight, Matthew 7 describes a house that is built upon the sand. It also describes a house that is built upon the rock. And in that seventh chapter, it teaches us that if the floods come and the wind blows, that the house on the sand will blow down. It is around the area of the justice of God and the integrity of God and the righteousness of God that people subtly build their homes and their Christian foundation becomes quite sandy. And the view of the cross is darkened because of a lack of a thorough understanding of God. Now, God judged his son Jesus Christ on the cross in strict justice. It was not a compassion expressed in weakness. It was an act of strict justice because all of God's justice has to be strict. Now, in verse 26, the Word of God makes it clear that God's justice is vindicated because in all of those years that he passed over sin, then his justice was not vindicated. Let me say that again. All of those years, the 4,000 years or so, that the Lord passed over sin and suspended the immediate effects of his justice. That's what he did. He suspended the immediate effects of his justice. Well, as he suspended it, at that point of history, his justice had not yet been vindicated. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross and shed his blood, then his justice was indeed vindicated. Now, stability is freedom from change. It actually is the property of a person when disturbed and because they are stable, they have enough doctrine to restore themselves to their original condition in a matter of moments. And this is freedom. This is stability. Stability is freedom from change in the, in the godly sense. Now, security is freedom from wanting anything. <clears throat> Someone says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. They really are practicing <clears throat> eternal security. And therefore, because they are, they are able to be predictable. A person who is a, pre a predictable person knows the things that are going to happen in advance. I do not mean prophecy, but I mean in terms of attitude, in terms of behavior, so that nothing surprises them because they are stable and they are mature. Dynamics or psychodynamics refers to the effect and significance of relationships, relationships which are very unique, a relationship that's based upon the process of growing up. A dynamic relationship or a psychodynamic relationship is a significant relationship because it's a person that is growing up. 
in growing up beautifully. A person that understands that he will not in any way have any measure of love beyond what he has for doctrine. The reason people are selfishness, are filled with selfishness, and realize selfishness is because they lack doctrine controlling their soul. So uh, women often are extremely selfish in details of life. Men are often mean and hateful behind the scene and arrogant, even uh, uh, doing anything with their wives. And the reason is they do not have integrity. Remember this, men or women, doesn't matter. When people are this way, they do not have integrity. And therefore, because they do not have integrity, they are free to express their old sin nature. Well, imagine at Calvary what would have happened if Jesus Christ did not have integrity, if God the Father did not have integrity. At Calvary, the Father and the Son, in Psalm 22, 1, both had to forsake Jesus Christ. The two members of the Trinity both forsook him, not just the Father, but the Holy Spirit also forsook the Son at Calvary. Now, at Calvary, it would have been very right from human viewpoint for God to beautifully have allowed love to take precedence over justice. I mean, here's your only begotten son. He has never sinned. He didn't know sin. He was with you in all eternity past. He had no beginning. He is an eternal son. And now the normal and natural thing would have been to have love to have taken precedence against justice. But love did not take precedence against justice. God never even considered allowing love to take precedence over justice. So what did he do? Immediately poured out all of his wrath on the Son because his integrity takes precedence over justice. And love had to, has to take a back seat. Well, the same thing is true in simple, practical ways that our integrity should take precedence over everything, but our integrity is not predictable. Our integrity is not natural. It is, it is normal for God's integrity to always be integrity. His integrity is immutable and it never changes. The best human being living isn't consistent with his integrity. His integrity is regulated by how he feels, by his circumstances, and by the power and influence that other people have over his life. His integrity is shaded by circumstances and influential members of his family, and the average individual couldn't truly define integrity 24 hours a day to anyone. But God's integrity takes first place in life. Now, when Jesus Christ be became the justifier to make us just, while in the Old Testament the forbearance of God suspended the effects of sin and justice had not yet been vindicated, then Jesus Christ and his perfect righteousness avenged justice. His perfect righteousness avenged justice. When the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus Christ and he ended into three hours of spiritual death and then he ended into physical death. Now, as this took place, perfect strict justice was immediately completely and totally executed. At that point, when strict justice had been perfectly executed against the perfect Lamb of God, 
because God's righteousness loved the life of Jesus Christ because his, right, his life was perfect. So God's love was poured out on Jesus Christ's life until our sins were placed upon him. Now pure mercy, without any merit from man whatsoever, can save the worst sinner in the world. And the chief of sinners can be totally saved. And again, propitiatory, propitiatory sacrifice becomes an assurity for us. And immediately when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. For this reason, Isaiah 30, verse 18, takes care of the period when forbearance of God suspended the act of justice until Calvary when justice was vindicated. Because we have this great principle in Isaiah 30, verse 30, 18, that God is waiting to be righteous. God is waiting to be gracious because we are not yet righteous. So therefore, God's righteousness guards God's justice. God's righteousness guards God's justice. Wherever God's righteousness is lacking, God's justice cannot be executed. It can only be executed in the program of divine essence. Now, Righteousness of God rejects sin, just like the justice of God condemns sin. So the righteousness of God rejects sin, and the justice of God condemns sin. Now in verse 25, we have the righteousness of God set forth. But then in verse 27, we have, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? No, by the law of faith. So God is saying here that I shut completely out men glorying in anything by justifying them as the just one when they believe. And when they believed, they were made absolutely righteous with my imputed righteousness. And I, at that time, set forth something. I set forth my righteousness for them. But in verse 27 of Romans 3, at the same time, I shut out them glorying in works or self-righteousness. And verse 27 is an aorist passive here. And God is the agent, and God received the action of refusing anything but his own righteousness. And all the glory belongs to God, and the aorist tense here is once and for all. So, we have this great practical principle that God's justice will always, always honor God's righteousness. That's why when we sin, we name it and forsake it and recover. The reason we do that is immediately we're back in the experiential flow of God's imparted righteousness and God's justice will always bless God's righteousness. When we are backslidden and refuse to name our sin, God's justice has to have some type of program to discipline us. Now, one of the most misunderstood verses in all the Bible probably is the one that we want to take you into tonight to show you how that God's absolute righteousness is the only thing that divine justice will bless. Now, if we asked you this question tonight, would you turn to Romans 8.28? Now, do you honestly, tonight, do you think that Romans 8.28, with all of its amazing content, 
is a beautiful verse for all believers. Do you raise your hand? Would you say that possibly that every believer in the world can trust in Romans 8.28? Raise your hands if you believe that's true. Do you think tonight that all things work together for good for every believer? If you do, raise your hands again. All right, do you think then it's fair for a Christian to think that all things work together for good <clears throat> in his life? Well, unfortunately, that's not what this teaches. All things do not work together for good, and that's the sad part of it. And the reason is, is because the perfect justice of God cannot bless believers beyond salvation beyond salvation they will forever have salvation the real believer in God's grace and the gospel of grace is forever saved sealed held in God's hand kept by the power of God but here is one of the most misunderstood verse by novices that have been in churches 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and it's just not biblical. I want to say it again tonight. All things do not work together for good. You can make decisions in your life tonight, and I'll guarantee you one million percent they do not work together for good. You can go out and sin tonight and that does not work together for good. You can marry the wrong person and Ezekiel 16 says that in most cases when you marry the wrong person you stay unhappy the rest of your life. It tells the story of a wrong marriage. No, all things do not work together for good. That's why you're in class, to hear it different, to hear it expressed differently and scripturally in a college uh, classroom status. Now, it would be great if everybody thought that every death works together for good. It does not. That every disease works together for good. It does not. That every divorce works together for good, it does not. Do you understand this? You don't until I prove it. Now, I'm making some very wild statements here, and I have to prove it. And unless I prove it, it's not, it is not valid. Well, Let's see what we can do with it. <laughs> now, the first thing is, God has declared his righteousness as a gift to every single person that believes in his absolute death on their behalf, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension. And everybody that believes in the gospel of grace they are absolutely declared to be righteous. Now, don't ever use the phrase just as if you never sinned. That is not true at all. That's good Sunday school material for an immature teacher that's never studied, but it's not for you. It's not just like you never sinned. That is not correct. Justification does not mean just as if you never sinned. You certainly did sin. Jesus bore your sin, paid for your sin, and has declared you righteous. He's never declared you uh, holy when you first got saved. He declared you righteous. He didn't declare you holy. Now, if it was just as if you never sinned, he could have declared you holy. Now, he says, be ye holy as he is holy. But when you get saved, you're in Christ. In that sense, you're holy. You're holy. 
Your position is a holy one, absolutely. But it's never just as if you never sinned. We did sin. I mean, if it was just as if we never sinned, then why would Christ have to have bore our sins? Why would we ever have to confess sin when we, re when we need to recover? No, we've been declared righteous in our relationship. But remember, we've not been declared holy. But justification is God declaring us to be righteous freely by the gift of grace because his justice was absolutely and totally vindicated in the strictest sense. And when his justice was finally vindicated and righteousness guarded it, but righteousness then could behave in a certain way toward the perfection of Christ's human life. And this freed up love and it freed up grace to be given to men. Because when God imputed righteousness to every believer without works, then God's justice then could be with that believer as long as that believer lived on earth in terms of positional truth. But now we come to our lives and the all things that happen. And this is where more people have never t studied this and there's about eight or twelve, maybe nine uh, scholars that have worked hard on this throughout the last 1900 years and understand it. Eight or nine out of maybe a hundred that I know about. And so there's nine percent that I have searched and searched and searched that seem to understand this. And, and this is, and one of them is Archbishop Trench. And I want you to see this, how this works. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Now, do you think that that's true? No, that isn't the way it should have been written. Now, let me show you tonight why. The number of the subject must agree with the number of the verb. Say that back to me so we won't get ahead of you. The number of the subject must agree with the number of the verb. Now, a singular subject, a singular verb. Now, no, let me ask you this question. Can a singular verb take a plural subject? By the way, uh, I went out uh, the other night at a Greek restaurant for the, I was, and I went out and for the first time in my life, I know all kinds of Greek from now on. Now, the number of the subject must agree with the number of the verb. Now, the plural should agree with the plural. But what this really says is a singular verb can take a plural object. Is that correct? Can a singular verb take a plural object? Can it? Yes. The answer is yes. Now, let me show you tonight what this really says because of the introductory remarks that I've already made about the number of the subject must agree with the number of the verb and the singular subject and the single verb. However, a singular verb can take a plural object. Now, all things do not work together for good. Let me just say that very quickly because it's true. All things do not work together 
for good. Now, we have this structure. This is how it should have been. God, or Hotheos, or God, works all things together for who? Instead of all things being put first, God should have been put first. So, oida is a word here. And we know. And we know. Oida is a perfective present. And it's something that happened in the past that has a present reality. And we know. Present active participle of agapao and the participle and the definite article and a dative case. Now, and we know something in the past that has present results. And active voice and then the participle with the definite article and the dative case of advantage. This is what the Word of God is saying, that God works all things together for divine good, but only to them that love him. And you can't sit there tonight and tell me believers all love God. Now do you see this? Most believers, hear me now, do not love God only with puppy love. Most believers do not love God properly. And the reason that no one can love God properly unless they are saturated with God's Word. Because I can never love God beyond what God thinks. And only as I understand what God thinks and I submit to what God thinks so that my submission allows the Holy Spirit to fill me with who God is and then when I submit to what God thinks because I have a local church and I invest hours whether I feel like it or not I'm disciplined whether I feel like it or not I go to class whether I feel like it or not I listen to tapes whether I feel like it or not because any intelligent person would do this and so on the basis of having a local assembly and a prescribed, disciplined program of receiving the Word of God, and then on the basis of submitting to that that I receive so that the Holy Spirit can control me. So having doctrine with the Holy Spirit's control produces a love for God. And there is no substantial love for God to people that just know they're saved and know a few good verses that they quote with no hermeneutical ability, with absolutely no hermeneutical understanding at all, and after they've been going to school or been going to church for 15 years, they get up and everybody that knows the Word of God is embarrassed when they try to say something because they do not know God's Word. They should by now be saturated with it, but they don't know it because they've never placed their mind in academic discipline and concentration. They didn't listen to the Word of God because they were spiritually lazy. Therefore, they can never, ever have a love that for God that surpasses their family, that surpasses their best friends, that surpasses situations. They can, can't do it. The only way that I can love God is to know what He thinks Otherwise, my love would be sentimental. I must know what God thinks. 
and I must know what God says in situations. Obviously, otherwise, my love will be subjective and abstract. I must know what God thinks about every day's activity in every night's decision in everything I do. I must have the mind of God if I'm going to obey him. How can I obey God if I don't have his mind of instructions? So don't you ever think that some people you think love God, love God. They don't love God. They may be very nice people. But the answer is absolutely limited love. We are limited to our love for God. This is why time and time again churches have splits and, and the pastor uh, does something wrong or something happens in the church and people fly away like you wouldn't believe it. Why do they fly away? They don't have an ounce of love for God. Because God tells them, unless that pastor is doctrinally incorrect in cardinal doctrines, and unless he's in immorality and will not quit it, those two things, or he gossips. Other than those three things, they, they, uh, they cannot possibly leave that local assembly except they're selfish and wicked and have no concept that you don't leave a husband or a wife when something goes wrong. You've made vows in your marriage. And you don't leave a local church when something goes wrong. You need to pay your vows to the congregation in Psalm 116. What is paying your vows to the congregation? To the congregation? Reflecting Jesus' unconditional love toward you, and you're paying those vows to the people in, in action. In Psalm 116, based upon stewardship of grace, 1 Peter 4.10, stewardship of love, 1 Peter 4.8, and stewardship of mercy, Luke 6.36-37, and stewardship of forgiveness, Matthew 5.38-46 with Luke 6.37. And we are in requirements to be faithful to the stewardship of mercy, stewardship of love, stewardship of grace, stewardship of forgiveness. We are to be caretakers of these doctrines. And when we obey these doctrines and let submit to the nature of God with the Holy Spirit and reflect the life of these doctrines, then all things work together for good. Do you understand this? So don't you ever let anybody ever again get away with saying, and we know that all things work together for good. That is not right. If a person doesn't love God, things may be given him. He may receive logistical grace. He may receive the mercy and patience. I'm not saying he doesn't in the plan of God. But his sins do not work together for good. So here we have this great principle. We have here that God is the subject. Now, all things are the object. We have the words panta, P-A-N-T-A, and along with that, we have the beautiful word that means together. Now, God works. Oh, let's put it this way. God works all things together for good. If a believer has categorical doctrine and submits to it, and if a believer submits to the cross for the filling of the Spirit, then that believer can go through persecutions, attacks, 
rejection and his family can die on him, everything under the sun can happen, and that believer is guaranteed that every single thing will work together for good. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in his heart by the Holy Spirit, and because you can only love God when you know the mind of God. You can't love God if you don't have the mind of God. The mind of God isn't some abstract emotional experience. The mind of God is categorical doctrine. All scriptures are profitable. Study to show thyself approved. Live by every word of God. Be sanctified by every word of God. Now, how am I going to know what God is thinking when I haven't studied? And how am I going to know what God wants me to be like if I'm not sanctified by his spirit in that doctrine? First, I go to class, I go to church under all circumstances because of discipline. Tomorrow night in the Revelation class, I'm really going to hit this. The fullness of Jesus Christ is in the body, not in a something else outside of the body, not in your job, not in anything. The fullness of Christ is the body. That's Ephesians 1, 23. And we are told not to forsake the assembling of that body's function. We're not to forsake it if possible. And so we plan to do it much more as we see the day approaching. Why do we plan to attend class and church more without being arrogant and proud and resisting opportunities to have a capacity to love? Maximum doctrine gives me maximum capacity to love God. Maximum doctrine gives me maximum capacity to love you. Maximum doctrine gives me maximum capacity for patience toward God, toward God's plan. We don't have to be patient toward God. And maximum love gives me uh, the capacity to be patient toward you. And that's the way it goes. And if I don't have the mind of God, no way under heaven can I ever treat you with the proper attitude. I can't do it with my mind because my mind is corrupt. It's depraved. It's degenerated. And the best it can do is live in human good, and that smells all the way up to the nostrils of God. Is that clear? So I must have the mind of Christ. This is why Philippians 2.5, Paul said, Let this very mind be inside of you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who has the mind of God that he may instruct him? We have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.16 And listen, is it any wonder that God says to love the Lord thy God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your strength, that means body, and with all your soul, that's five punk five parts of your self-essence, four areas were to love God in, heart, soul, mind, and body. And you can't do that unless your mind knows what to do to love him. You can't do that unless your mind knows what he thinks. How am I going to love God if I don't know what he wants me to do or uh, doesn't want me to do? There's no way under heaven I can love him. Because if you, you love me, you keep my commandments. How can I keep God's commandments? First of all, by knowing what they are and knowing what he says and then letting love take over my behavior. Well, you and I, you and I don't do something to satisfy God or to, to get God's acceptance of us. We obey God because it's an evidence of what we already have. We don't do it to win God's favor. We have God's favor. So we obey God to reveal automatically the evidence that we're in God's favor. James wasn't disagreeing with Paul in James 2.24. Not at all. James was simply saying, if you're filled with the Spirit and filled with doctrine, you will have a faith that works. 
not the works of the flesh, not the works of the flesh, but a faith that works. In other words, your faith will work. Well, why wouldn't anyone want their faith to work? He doesn't say work and God will be pleased. He says if you have your, the right kind of faith, obviously it will win souls. Obviously it will love its wife. Obviously she'll love her husband. Obviously it will come to the local assembly. Obviously it will submit to the local pastor. Obviously it will be a portion in the body. Obviously it will lay down its life for God. If she has the right content, in her soul, her faith will obviously work in what Romans 1 5 b calls faith obedience. And that becomes in Romans 3 27 the law of faith. And we're getting that's what we're discussing tonight, Romans 3 27. The law of faith, not the law of works. Now every night we try to hit some angles that are brand new to your soul so that you can feast on principles that will make you have a depth to you that is beyond the average Christian in the world except remnants in other places and all churches have their beautiful remnants but the deep wants to call into the deep what does that mean when God wants an errant he wants to be in touch with you so he can call in the deep part of your soul and you'll hear him without an audible voice when God wants a job done he wants you to be so cultivated in the depth of your living being to the Holy Spirit and to doctrine that the Holy Spirit can pull that doctrine out of your, out of your memory and your frame of reference and bring it right into your memory and you'll say, oh, this is the way. And you can't explain it, but it's objective. It's the Word of God and it's doctrine applied to your perception and then to your heart. And you begin to know what God wants of you. And it's always characterized by love with integrity and the integrity has to be doctrine every man's a liar the only integrity i have is doctrine when i'm living in doctrine i have integrity if i'm not living in doctrine i don't even know what 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 it's like to be honest because there's a royal law of love oh i know in daily living not to lie but i'm talking about something far deeper than human viewpoint i'm talking about divine viewpoint Calvary's viewpoint, finished work viewpoint that said that David never turned aside. That was divine integrity. Man's viewpoint would have crucified him alive. And man's viewpoint would have been dishonest toward divine viewpoint of integrity. That's what we mean. How many understand that? So, you see then the beautiful thing of it is, and by the way, when we got in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them uh, who are called according to his purpose. And when we have to them that love God, there's a very beautiful thing here. We have a, gener a generic article with theos. A generic article with theos. And why do we have a generic article with theos? One reason in the original writings. Why do we have a generic article with theos? Because he's emphasizing God's divine attributes. He wants to believe it to reflect on God's essence, his integrity, his justice, his righteousness, his veracity, his omniscience, his omnipresence, his omnipotence, his immutability, his love, his grace, his long-suffering. He wants the reader who is filled with the Spirit to reflect upon his essence. Now, what does that mean? I must know what essence wants of me. How am I going to know with this generic article what essence wants of me? By studying his doctrine. Because his doctrine is his mind. And put it in categories and then submit to it. That's how I know essence is to have divine essence control me with divine viewpoint beyond human capacity. And when my capacity has the word of God and the filling of the spirit, I have a capacity no matter what I feel or don't feel 
to obey God in the law of faith. And it's never a law of works. But the law of faith produces evidence in the, the systematic way of life. How many understand this? Father, dismiss us in Jesus' name. Amen.